Good afternoon, everyone. This is Chaitali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. Today is an iconic day for Indian Army, a day on which the force is celebrating the raising day of its aviation corps. And who better than Lieutenant General B.S. Pawar, whom the Indian Army knows as Bali Pawar, who was the head of the Army Aviation Corps. So it is time to hear the story of the corps from the man who lived the air power of the force from air OP days to aviation core days to the current status. We welcome you, sir, to the ADU chat room. And now I request editor Sangeeta Saxena to steer the discussion ahead. Thank you, Chitali. Thank, thank you very much, Chitali. Welcome, Balli, sir, to ADU's chat room. And uh, before we begin, congratulations on the 35th raising day of the Army Aviation Corps, sir. Thank and you, who better? Chetali is very right when she says who better. So the story has to come from the horse's mouth. And so you begin with telling us, you know, what it was like. You saw the trifurcation because you are from the RT originally. You saw the trifurcation. What was it like? What was the trifurcation? How did you, uh, AROP become the Army Aviation Support? So we'd like to know everything about well, Sangeeta, my, you have kindled my memories back to 1986. That was the second tenure of mine in AROP. I was doing a BM in a brigade in Pithoragarh. And after about nine months, I came on promotion to Bagdogra. All AROP units were Air Force units. They were called so-and-so AROP Air Force. So the iconic day, there was, a, of course, the process had been on for so long to get the Army Aviation Corps uh, out of the artillery and make it an independent corps. More so because to get out of the control of the Air Force. Now, Air, because the Air Force treated this as its own unit. And the Army wanted an aviation corps where the helicopters fly for the army and not both for the Air Force and the army and are always beholden to the Air Force for any uh, sort of effort, helicopter effort or any other effort which was required. So the day, I still remember, it came on 1st November 1986. And I happened to be commanding a flight in Bagdogra as part of a 659 Air OP squadron. It was a very exciting day. Almost 30 helicopters lined up on the parade ground. Uh, uh, it's a sorry, dispersal come uh, runway. And a parade held, a major parade, in which both Air Force and Army participated. And I was part of that event. It was held in Bagdogra. And similarly, at other stations, you know, different squadrons held the parades at their own level. And we formed the Army Aviation Corps. We came out of the artillery and we came away from the Air Force. But it was a challenging task because the next six months were very, very demanding and challenging because we had to establish, we had to get out of the Air Force station establish our own bases, and also take on all the responsibilities that Air Force till that time was undertaking in dropping, you know, in um, casual, casualty evacuations, in surveillance, but everything that they were doing along with the AROP, now the, Aero, uh, the Army Aviation Corps had to do it alone. And I still remember from a flight commander I became second in command of the Army Aviation Squadron in uh, Bagdogra. So it was a big day. And today, right. I am very happy to see that 35 years of his existence are over. It's made a lot of strides, but there are a lot of shortcomings, which I will cover subsequently. So that's how the Army Aviation Corps came into being. Right, sir. Uh, one uh, thought we just kindled after you spoke was that you said we got away from the Air Force. Now, did that mean also getting new runways for yourself? 
yes uh, sangeeta what it meant was that we had to now make our own bases the fact right. that we only had helicopters we did not me- need long runways yes what we needed was heliports a heliport should have a dispersal and should have not a runway typically but almost a heliport where you can have helicopters operating various dispersals number of helipads where the helicopters can land so it is uh, we had to uh, you know get land i still i can uh, quote number of places there were places we were already at a airfield like misamari in the east now there there was no problem we were already in a base in jalandhar we were already in a base in uh, nagrota so all these places came up and we thereafter bought the land was bought and the bases established in the, over the defense land that's how these bases came so this air force was very clear you have not broken away from us please find your own bases and operate on your own so it was a task and but we did it yeah. right perfect that's wonderful actually so nice to hear all that because generally you i was always under this impression that when you got it the air force would have you know and i very generously donated some place or something to you and a part of the town mag run way where you could you know so i was always under this impression that it was a carry over story no, there was and, an agreement uh, uh, sangeeta there was an agreement between the two services signed a memorandum of under, understanding where some existing bases like misamari where a runway existed came to us but there were very few there were very few 80% of the places we had to construct our own build our own infrastructure so that's where Absolutely. it stood all right right sir that's actually wonderful and sir what was the beginning like what were the what did you have what was your air power like see in the beginning whatever existing helicopters were there that is the cheetah and chetak they were transferred to us one of the biggest bain of this you know this transfer uh, from aerop to army aviation was that we had these attack helicopters in the form of chetaks basically that time the me 25 and 35 is not come uh, they were also transferred and they were the, actually they were in the process coming the me 25 and 35 the air force managed to convince the government that they will not be able to operate these you know attack helicopters so for a time being they should only hold these helicopters and what is more interesting is they said they should not have any helicopters beyond 5 ton the army should not operate any helicopters beyond 5 ton okay all that has changed now but this is what i'm saying at that time uh, was there so we got whatever is existing those flights which are existing became army aviation units squadrons became army aviation units and we basically were operating chetaks and cheetah when this was formed nothing else and when did the expansion happen beyond that when did you get your migs and the others see uh, i'll tell you the first 10 years was consolidation the first decade because establishing remember we had to entirely train the initial batches were trained by the air force the technical staff the most important who have to maintain the helicopters maintain the aircraft so the first thing we uh, you know the the first thing we inducted was the alh advanced light helicopter which we inducted with the army inducted the first it had some problems the air force was reluctant to induct it till they rectified it but uh, the army in its uh, wisdom went ahead and inducted these in early 2000 these helicopters and we are the first that the first squadron was raised i think 2003 or 4 uh, 2002 in the army aviation co we had a lot of teething problems I, i still remember you know if 10 helicopters are there a squadron which is raised at times you would have only two services but then we got the hl going and uh, the hl position the team so this 
the the first growth the first sign of growth was when the alh advanced light helicopter which is a five ton twin engine state of art helicopter was inducted into army aviation and i am proud and i can say with a lot of confidence that today the army aviation operates the maximum number of alhs the armed version as well as the utility version in the indian armed forces today and is doing a terrific job in operating them and today they have come of age the alh today is one of the best helicopters in the world i can vouch for it that's wonderful sir and uh, eventually did you get the russian choppers see we we have always been vying uh, for other choppers to come in one thing was very clear you know when i told you the 5 ton the the alh is 5.5 ton yeah. okay so they couldn't say anything because they didn't want it we took it yeah. but there were no question of the me 17 or the me 8s coming to the army they won't uh, that won't happen and i knew it so we concentrated on others so we concentrated on apache and uh, you'll be glad to know that while the air force has got the 22 apaches which will ultimately be in war be used by the uh, army because they are in support of army but these six apaches are also sanctioned for the indian army aviation co uh, only thing is due to this pandemic and due to other reasons we would have otherwise started getting them by this year those six apaches 11 were asked for but the government in his wisdom and due to financial constraints only uh, cleared six so we are get, going to get from next year onwards the six will start coming in so that's a big step one of the most modern one of the most ferocious one of the most lethal attack helicopters in the world the apache is also coming to army aviation co so that's the other you would asked about the russian helicopters you know our biggest bane today is the chita chetak that's the maximum army aviation operates almost 200 pieces we had an accident last year in september where the two pilots died it was it happened in bhutan mm-hmm. we had an accident this september in uh, jnk on the ban near banihal again both the pilots died now this is a vintage helicopter uh, i mean in france which is a country of origin has put it in the museum and we are still flying them and not only flying them but flying them in high altitudes in siachen in now in the standoff in uh, ladakh yes. and this is the helicopter which is lifeline of troops in high altitude areas and we have not been able to replace it prime minister modi and the russian president signed an agreement in 2014 for the car 226t yes which is a capable helicopter it has been through trials in india <coughs> and it can operate in high altitudes but what frustrates me and what i am you know intrigued at times Six years have elapsed. A deal signed at the level of the prime minister. We have still not signed the contract. That's the Indian bureaucracy for you. But I also blame a top hierarchy of the Indian Army. Why haven't we pushed? Why are we flying these uh, helicopters are now called the flying coffins, like the MiG-21? I mean, every every year you find two, three falling out of the sky, losing lives. and the confidence in 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 flying this machine if this continues to happen so the car 226 due to some minor issues is nowhere on the scene it is still not come into the uh, uh, in uh, i mean there is i don't see a silver lining even in the next few uh, months of its coming into the uh, being inducted into the indian armed forces so that's where it stands right so so in july we had gone to the moscow air show and uh, there you know you had the whole hal team with some officials and you know they were all there and they came to see come off 226 and uh, you know we were we thought you know that probably something is developing somewhere so uh, we can just hope that something has developed somewhere and uh, the thing gets you know it moves ahead that's our only hope actually the so point me, is the uh, sangeeta yes, the point is that it has to move you have you have nothing 
this aircraft is not sustainable what you got today you can't maintain it you can't sustain it there will be a, such a critical operational void uh, i i don't know whether you saw the newspapers early this year an sos has been raised by the armed forces all the three services yes. because they all three services operating that mm -hmm. there is a critical operational void occurring if this cheeta chetak is not replaced at the earliest but unfortunately no action all we see is hcl going and seeing the car 226 again which right. is surprising right and uh, so when we continue i i know i understand that there is a very critical gap and uh, what how do we plan to fulfill this gap is indigenization the only mantra sir or uh, you know in addition to come on we getting a passage what else can we get see the hcl has got a lot of projects on uh, going on and one of the projects which was to assist in the replacement of cheeta chetak along with whatever was to come you know uh, about 200 which were, we were to come through trials they were to provide another 184 or almost 200 and the luh is the product of that light utility helicopter 3 ton class which is already done it has been given the initial operation clearance by both air force and army it is operated in uh, high altitude uh, last year it did in the winters but the problem is there its uh, production is still uh, far away the reason is this there are still some issues which needs to be rectified in this helicopter you know army has given the ioc on conditions that you rectify the two major faults which exist which hcl has to rectify only then they can go into production while both the services are given initial operation clearance but uh, i do not see this production uh, the helicopter going into production before the end of next year and at best it'll take another 5 to 6 years for them to produce the 200 helicopters that we are asking for because they have got other projects going on like the lch light combat helicopter where again the indian army is the biggest stakeholder in the numbers we are we are expecting to go up to 114 uh, light combat helicopters whenever they come but in the replacement of cheeta chetak the the government has to move forward this car 226 at the earliest and the luh i i have another suggestion in the interim you lease these uh, world class helicopters are available which have done trials in india from bell as well as eurocopter lease some of them overcome that and that is the uh, way forward you know not you know stop gap measures by producing something cheetal cheetal is a helicopter cheeta modified with a stronger engine indian army assigned for 30 as uh, for 30 but that's not the answer that's not the answer right sir that's what i was wondering that uh, i if we put all the eggs in the same basket which is hcl so how long do we wait it's a very very huge wait with geopolitical situations changing on the borders i think you know uh, one can exactly uh, advise the government to go ahead with other options which are there which are available and leasing of course is one of those very good options as you said so what is the current status of the uh, aviation core is it sufficient to uh, at the moment i'm talking of at the moment is it sufficient that suppose there's a two front war is it sufficient will it be able to uh, you know suffice our needs is agita there are two major critical gaps that exist in army aviation which need to be made up forthwith one is i told you the light helicopters they are the lifeline uh, and we need to i have said enough on that the second issue is we are producing armed alh which is called the rudra okay the unfortunate part is it has only rockets and machine gun 
we do not have anti tank guided missile the nag is still I, I, the drdo produced nag is still nowhere on the scene and not only that we do not even have air to air missiles the mistral for which we had you know worked and signed earlier the contract those missiles also have not come for the last 6 years uh, reasons best known why this government delay on acquiring those so you can have a attack helicopter operating in eastern ladakh but if he doesn't have anti tank guided missiles i i think it is more of a you know gunship which is operating there we have to get the these helicopters like the lch let's say from next year we start inducting the lch but if the lch has no air to air missile it has no air to ground missile then what do i call it a gunship just with rockets and this thing what is he going to do against the tanks we need to work we have critically short our attack helicopters irrespective of apaches cannot operate there you know a lot of media played out of apache flying in lay i can go and fly in lay with you know uh, without uh, any of these uh, uh, weapon systems on board but the apache is meant for planes and it cannot operate in this situation existing therefore we have to we have to speed up and arm these helicopters which are operating there because there is no match today with the chinese in numbers there is no match in numbers and you are talking of two front war today with the helicopters that are available especially in the attack category even for one front war they are not sufficient they are not sufficient yeah. no way near right sir. Right, so and I understand what you're saying. So, in addition to uh, the choppers, the uh, Army Aviation Corps has also got the UAVs. So, uh, I would like to understand from you that uh, what is it uh, like? I mean, are we sufficient? Do we have uh, what? What is the status of the UAVs we have? Are they just surveillance? Uh, there's a process of arming the UAVs also. How much of that is there? So, if you could just update our viewers on. or the uav france see because uh, uavs were the were with the artillery this transfer yes. transformation now has taken place it's in the process the assets are being transferred so basically we are operating the searcher mark 2 and the heron these are basically surveillance uavs hmm. they have also gone in for if you uh, know the heron tp which can be armed hmm. so that that is the, one of the armed versions but we were also going in for this uh, you know the uh, the version of the guardian which the navy has taken two of them on uh, on uh, lease and there there's a talk that the army may also get the land version of uh, this uh, particular uav 10 of these which will be deadly in case uh, the process is on uh again in numbers they are uh, they are woefully inadequate uh, if we have a two front war to operate in the east as well as in the west but for a one front i mean at presently what we have they are capable of operating uh, the heron tp can operate high altitude as well so uh, the army vision is getting into grips with it uh, it is just uh, you know the transfer process in my last uh, what i heard is is on but uh, there is a need for much more also there are a lot of players on the in the in the in the indian market startups which have come and are producing uavs i think we need to encourage those so that our critical gaps in even in the requirement of numbers in the uavs in the category that we want get filled up while the smaller categories with the infantry will operate i i have got no doubt that the the indigenous market will look after it but in the medium and high altitude and the higher level we'll need uh, maybe exports till the time we have our own capability hcl has also been working on it drdo has been working on it but those uavs are nowhere on the scene if you remember nishan that come but it did not succeed uh, it had a problem in landing recovery process mm-hmm. so we need to there are others being developed uh, by the hal 
uh, and the DRDO, and uh, but they are not, uh, you know, including the armed one, but not on the anvil as yet. They are nowhere on the horizon. We'll have to wait and see. Right, sir. So, anything else which you'd like to add? See, one thing I want to uh, add to you that army aviation has come of age. It is an arm now. Uh, it is an arm of decision as far as the army is concerned. It is operating in areas where people think twice to go and operate in the world over. And this has become second nature to the Army Aviation Corps. I mean, to land a helicopter at 19,800 feet on a matchbox-looking helipad requires skill and courage of the highest order. Secondly, a lot of people say, you know, used to have comments that the Army Aviation cannot, you know, operate the most sophisticated helicopters like the Apache. Or their technician will not be able to maintain these helicopters. You must have also heard it over the years. A lot of people making such statements. It has come in the uh, print media as well. I remember and I gave a rebuttal to that. But today the Army Aviation has come of age. It is now commanded by a Lieutenant General, who is an Army aviator and part of the permanent cadre, and not from outside like uh, people like me went and became ADG Army Aviation. So this arm is, uh, is growing, but I think the army hierarchy and the government must give it the way with all it needs in terms of helicopters, which can operate at these altitudes and the numbers have to in be increased. And HAL must get his act together. It has a lot of programs. If they can give us the LCH light combat helicopter, if they can give us the LUH and if they can you know, arm the current uh, Rudra, the ALH, that'll go a long way in making the Army Aviation Corps a very effective corps, and it'll be a battle winner of the future. Thank you so much, sir. It's a battle winner even today. And I'm very sure, I've, uh, you know, I, I have all faith that our Army, our corps, be it the infantry, be it the uh, aviation, be it the engineers, they're all, you know, ready. They're the armored, they're all ready. And when there's a, you know, when there is a calamity, which is not natural and uh, made in the borders by the neighbors, I'm sure they'll all stand and uh, we have the best in hand. Yes, we need to develop them. There is no doubt. Every corps needs its own, it has its own wish list. And you also have your own, uh, your Aviation Corps also has its own. So it'll be a great pleasure to finally hear from you that little bit of a story, which we've always heard that you uh, crash landed and uh, there was a, you were flying and you crash landed and you thought this was the end. So we'll end with that story. I go back uh, 1973, <laughs> flying, uh, uh, Oster Mark 9, fixed wing small aircraft, uh, a very versatile, a very good aircraft. I still remember that. And going on an operational sortie, flying along the Punch uh, Rajauri border along the uh, with PO, uh, Pakistan. And having finished the sortie without any incident, uh, coming back to land at Jammu airfield. And when uh, around about 500 feet, uh, when I was my final approach, I find that the, the stick is uh, the, which gives you the nose, taking the nose up and down, is not responding. And uh, there was a co-pilot with me who was a rookie pilot. He, he is just about 100 hours. So I tried to shake it around, this thing, nothing. And then the aircraft went into a dive. And I could see that we are just approaching at such a fast speed with the nose down the runway. So that's the time I gave a mayday call to the uh, ATC. I said, might as well, mayday, mayday, this thing. <laughs> uh, and I managed to mention this, that uh, control's not functioning. I don't know. The last 
200 feet. Uh, I had already the runway was nowhere in sight now because we were, I think, uh, gone off towards, and I saw a lot of trees. I pushed my right rudder uh, full uh, to the the thing and moved the stick again. Some movement was there, and I could feel the nose coming up. But the next thing in the nose is we were hitting, uh, hit some trees and all and. By the time I realized what is happening, there was we were already there was foam all over the aircraft. The crash, uh, you know, the aircraft have already already come, and uh, that's the time in my mind I thought the last 200 or 100 feet when they were left, I said this is the end, Bali Pawa, <laughs> this is the end, <laughs> because I didn't see. I thought I had, we are going nose down into, but I, Sangeeta, you know this is what. Uh, it comes into you it's natural it's instinct to do something kept on you know till the last i didn't give it up and something must have you know finally worked because it broke our, that crash which was nose down and we crashed with with the belly uh, finally because that's how the aircraft was lying and i was hanging from my strap so was my copilot and he was yelling as if he's got uh, so much of hurt anyway uh, luckily, because the people, uh, I had given the Mayday call, the already foam was all over. The fire, there was no fire. The fire was avoided, and that's what saved us. Uh, we were taken out. There were a lot of uh, bruises, cuts on my forehead and this thing, but we survived. But uh, that is one accident I can never forget. That, heli that uh, aircraft with one wing broken and the nose and the propeller flown off and everything... This thing uh, is still there in my album, <laughs> one photograph. <laughs> so yes, that was a uh, that was the incident which happened, the accident. In, in a short, I've told you. Uh, yeah. I mean, it uh, just listening to you got us goosebumps, and I tell you, I I really when I go back to think as to what you would have felt, I uh, really it's all hats off to you, hats off to you, absolutely. But the uh, the best part of this is. My father was posted in Jammu those days, and I was also in Jammu. I never told them about this accident. But the people who saw this, all this happening, some civilians outside who knew him, they rang him up that your son has had an accident. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so he, I suddenly find my father there, and I was in the MH. They were you know, attending to me on the cuts and all. Uh -huh. So that is how it is. But... Uh, I continued. I flew that. Where, uh, which I think is just the right point to tell our viewers that uh, you are a third generation army officer, isn't it? Yes, totally. Uh, so uh, your grandfather was where, sir? He was in uh, in the famous Saragadi Battalion. Wonderful. At, 36, huh? 39, 36 Sikh. Uh, and I've got his medals with me. Four wow. Of them Wonderful. Earned in uh, uh, all these battles, uh, wow. which the fought for the British as part of 36 Sikh. Hmm. Uh, I know he was in Egypt, that time called Mesopotamia. Hmm. He used to tell me about it. He was in China. He was in Afghanistan. And uh, those medals, uh, you know, the British people, I didn't, the ribbons had frayed, but the British embassy here about uh, eight years back got those ribbons for me, got them, you know, polished the medals and everything. And I wear them very proudly on the right side of my chest. Whenever Wonderful, a, yeah. Wonderful, and he also fought the World War One, isn't it? Yeah, he. This was World War One. My grandfather. Ha, ha. My dad and was co commissioned dad also was... in uh, Second World War. Hmm. He got commissioned in forty-five. Uh, sorry, nineteen forty-three. So he fought the World War Two, sir. Two. He was there in the last part of it, and uh, then of course when this forty-seven thing took place, he was in. Uh, Fourth Sunday man in Pakistan with his uh, okay. battalion. Uh -huh. He's from Mahar Regiment. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, he was with Krishna Rao and Sundarji, and he were compatriots. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh.
Wonderful, sir. That's, I think, uh, not only is your journey with the Army Aviation Corps, but also your personal journey as a soldier, very, very interesting. Thank you very much, sir, for being on the show. And uh, I think, you know, every year we are going to wait for this day when we can get you to tell us more about more stories about your flights and sorties and Army Aviation Corps. Thanks a ton, sir. And also a very happy raising day to you again. Thank you, Sangeeta. It's been, Thank you so it's much, been wonderful. Sir. Yes, actually, to tell you the truth, these days, uh, when we celebrate these raising days and all, it's it's so nice to hear from people like you, those uh, brave days and the days that you have fought to get them in front of our audience. It's it's a really nice feeling even for me to hear them from you. It's, um, it's a great feeling. Thank you so much, sir, for taking this time for us. Thank you, Chitali. Thank you, ADU. Right, sir. It's always, okay, uh, sir. It's always wonderful. Always wonderful. Wonderful Thanks, to sir. have you, sir. Wonderful to wonderful have you. To have you sir. Sir.